welcome everybody welcome to this event which is a masterclass with top screenwriter jed mercurio and the format this is going to take is a conversation between myself and michael stewart i teach creative writing at the university of huddersfield i'm also a writer um in conversation with jed and this event um is hosted by the university of huddersfield but i think it is open to people outside as well um i think the bulk of um of our audience will be our students we're very interested to hear about the industry and about your, your background jed um you probably don't need any introduction to jed mercurio but i'm going to do it anyway um jed mercurio is probably our most successful um, screenwriter of tv drama um best known for uh, bodies the bodyguard and most famous i think more than anything line of duty um he's written some of our most popular most successful shows um not only as a screenwriter he's directing a producer he began his career uh, as a doctor and an officer in the air force before transitioning to uh, screenwriting um so we can't give you a round of applause to welcome you jed but um the sentiment is there we're very very chuffed to have you here and grateful for your uh, generosity you know i know you're busy i know you've got lots of things and lots of pies so thank you very much oh my pleasure thanks for having me on Great. So let's get started. I, I, I wonder what, what what I should say is that we've had a series of masterclasses. This is the culmination of a series of masterclasses this year. And um, what I've been doing with each of the screenwriters we've featured is asking them a little bit about their writing journey to begin with, where that where they began as a writer, um, how they got started, why they got started, when they got started, and how they kind of made that transition from a hobbyist, someone who enjoyed writing, into becoming an industry professional. Well, I, I took the traditional route, which was to have absolutely no interest whatsoever in being a writer. And then it just happened overnight as complete fluke. Um, I, uh, I, I went to a very ordinary comprehensive school in the Midlands. We didn't really study much in the way of creative writing or, or the arts at all. And to be honest, coming from a, a very working class background, the idea of a career in the media wasn't on the horizon. I was very sciencey. I did science A levels. I ended up going to medical school. At medical school, I got interested in aviation medicine, joined the Air Force, learned to fly planes. I kind of was going to uh, be uh, a specialist in aviation medicine during the Cold War. And then what actually happened was that there were defense cuts when the Cold War um, ended. And then um, I was working in the NHS when I saw an advert in the British Medical Journal, a TV production company were developing a medical drama. They were putting out a call for advisors who might be able to give them a steer on what were interesting issues going on in the NHS at the time. And, and when I read that advert, I was a, a house officer. I was in my first year of uh, medical practice at Birmingham Accident Hospital. And I kind of gone to medical school partly because I'd been influenced by the myths of TV medical drama it seemed all very glamorous and exciting and although the job is is a very important job and at times can be very exciting there's there's a, a darker side to it as well and, and working in the NHS in the 90s uh, as a junior doctor is incredibly long hours and lack of supervision and and real real stress on that particular group of people and I wanted to talk about that because it wasn't being represented in medical drama. And that started me on a, on a journey from being an advisor to someone they uh, they challenged to do some storylining and then eventually some script writing. And uh, I was incredibly fortunate that, that that transition period led to Cardiac Arrest, the TV series that aired on the BBC. Just let's go back a little bit because I... I... I'm interested in the kind of the, the stages, really. So you're you're answering an advert in a medical journal from a TV company. Who who was the TV company? Well, they were called Island World at the time. They're now World Productions, so the same yeah. production company that I've I've been working with uh, on and off for the last ten years on Line of Duty and Bodyguard. Yeah. And what was the medical drama they were making? They were developing something that was quite a vague thing that they were setting in general practice. I mean, to be honest, they didn't really have an idea. They just were, were looking at a territory that they wanted to explore. 
And that's, I think, why they were putting out this call to, to real doctors to see if there was some some true life stories or some some insights that they were missing out on. I guess it was a kind of way of just doing some very straightforward research for them. And I kind of gave them an insight into what my experience was of of hospital life from the perspective of being a junior hospital doctor. And in the in and in the early to sort of mid 90s, there were a lot of controversies around that about the working conditions for junior doctors, the long hours, the effect on patient safety and so forth. So you're an advisor, so you're working with a screenwriter at this point and you're you're basically giving them medical advice and advice about the reality of, of being a doctor and, and, and hospital work. No, the, I was actually advising the, the production team, so the producers and script editors, yeah. and they didn't have a writer, which was what that there was a, a gap to be filled. And that's why I think they asked me to do some storylining. Um, and so I storylined uh, an opening episode, which was uh, a, a real baptism of fire of someone in their first day as a hospital doctor. And it just was you know, packed with all the kinds of um, experiences that that I'd had and my peer group had had and, and, and a few kind of anecdotes and, and myths rolled in as well. And um, they really responded to it. But I think the thing that really made the difference was how cheap the show was because uh, <laughs> I was an untried writer and um, maybe a difficult subject, but um, they were an experienced production company. Tony Garnett was there. Margaret Matheson was there and uh, the BBC trusted them and they offered them, offered the BBC the show at about half the, the cost of a regular primetime drama with an unknown cast and, uh, the first primetime drama to be shot on DigiBeta, and um, the BBC took a took a chance on it. And and Tony Garner always said that he just he he always believed that the only way that you can really get away with creative risks is is to offer them something uh, at a very low cost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it still is a very risk averse industry, isn't it? I guess, and um, you know, if you can save pennies then you're more likely to have those opportunities but I'm, I'm still kind of i'm still kind of vague about so you you're, you're writing storylines yeah which is very different to writing scripts and a very different skill so how do you go from writing storylines to writing your first script so they showed me what a script looked like so they gave me some pages where i could see how you were supposed to lay it out and it kind of matched what i thought from watching tv and i'd watched a lot of television and, and it's a really important point that if you're going to write TV, you need to watch a lot of it. Um, so I kind of had a vague idea how things were done. Um, and and uh, it was very clear from reading scripts that you write down what people say and what they do. And there's not really much point writing anything else. And so um, I pictured the action and then I wrote it down. And that's what I still do and what most writers still do. But I mean, how did you learn your craft? Did you did you have a mentor? Did you did you go on a course? Did you read McKee? Did you you know what, what was your? I sort of did that after I I um I, I was trusted and encouraged, and I kind of went through an apprenticeship in writing because there were experienced producers, there were experienced um, script editors, and they um they were invested in in getting the project up on its feet. I think for a lot of writers, when they're starting out, they're on the outside and they're trying to sell their ideas. They're, they're either pitching ideas or they're writing spec scripts and they're trying to, to knock on the door with something that people don't know if they want. And, and, and often it's not what they're looking for. It's not anything to do with the quality of the work. It's just not what they're looking to develop commercially at that particular time whereas this was something where they kind of set their hats at getting a medical drama on the bbc and they liked the particular take that, that i gave them which was the inside story the looking behind the myths of medical drama and and and, and being revisionist of those things and trying to give it a really authentic or as authentic seeming texture as possible um, and so 
they were the ones encouraging me and they were the ones giving me the the sort of rules of thumb um you know when i i did a draft of the script they would point out uh this this bit should be changed because you're telling the audience something they already know or this bit should be changed because um you're telling rather than showing and all these things kind of went in and and you know i'd, I'd done very technical things in in medicine in the air force so i enjoyed the technical challenge and also probably fair to say that um i, I didn't mind criticism they could rip the script to shreds and I would just take their advice because having got, gone through those other other processes you know you, you in medicine you learn through humiliation usually um pe people don't hold back on telling you you've messed up so do you think in, in, in a way then the the experience you had as a, as a, as a junior doctor and, and your, your medical background and that that kind of um, culture of criticism and um learning on the job do you think that was a good training then for you as a script? Well, I think I think it's a transferable skill for anyone that if you if you're used to 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 learning new tasks and you're you're used to doing that in a very intense, high pressure way, and, and also you're up for it. You want you want to get it right. You, you it doesn't bother you if things are complicated, and um, then that that was obviously helpful. Yeah, yeah. And around this time, so it was around this time as well. You first started writing prose as well is that slightly later it was actually a little bit later I, I wrote scripts for about five years so I, I did cardiac arrest and then I, I did a, a comedy pilot which eventually got picked up for a series called the Grimleys Grimleys yeah um and actually when I was coming off the Grimleys um I went back into writing medical drama I started developing a, a medical drama for channel four and it, it wasn't a particularly good experience. It was, I mean, to be honest, it was like working for Channel 4 now. Uh, it was kind of like every week they changed their minds about what they wanted. And it, it, in the end, the project didn't happen. And so um, I decided to write it as a novel because I felt I had a clear idea on what I wanted to do. And so I wrote Bodies as a novel. And then um, it was later that that got picked up. and. Um, uh, there was an adaptation that that I that I wrote, which went on to the BBC. Yeah, because they're very different skills, aren't they? In very different disciplines, different different forms of writing. How do you sort of make the transition from being a screenwriter to being a novelist? Uh, again, are you training on the job, are you learning as you go, or? Yeah, I think it's different, or it certainly was for me, because when I was when I was writing script. I had a lot of people around me telling me that's that's no good change it what about this idea or that idea i don't really get this bit what what do you what do you mean all the things that you go through uh, at every stage of script writing and and i go through every day now that 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 forensic editorial input is is an important part of how the industry works and it's really important that writers are able to collaborate within that system Whereas writing a novel is much more um, solitary. The, the the influence of editors on most novelists is is slight in comparison to the, the the level of influence that the editorial team has on a scriptwriter. So it was more about reading books and deciding on what the style would be and what the voice would be and and that was something that that took a little bit of trial and error and i and i wrote some sample chapters and changed them repeatedly and and went through that process for a few months before i was happy with how i felt the sample chapters were reading and that was the point where um they were sent to publishers uh with a proposal for the novel and they often say, and, and there are so many exceptions, and as I'm saying this, I realise, but it's often said that it's not always a good idea for a novelist to adapt their own work because they're too close to it, you know, and, and often when you adapt a novel into a, a screenplay, it requires quite a radical rewrite, doesn't it? And, and a different way of looking at the story because you don't have point of view, you don't have interiority, and you have to tell a story in a different way. And you have to cut lots of things out as well, don't you? And if you're very precious about your material, and if you're very kind of um, close to it, I imagine that's, well, I know it's more more difficult. 
How yeah, that's, that's that? true. I, I think, uh, as ever, the, the, the proof of the pudding is in what you, you end up writing. But when I started working on bodies as, as a, a script adaptation, it was very clear that people were just interested in the thing that had inspired me to or motivated me to write the novel, which was something that was was about the darker side of medicine and 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 less kind of surface and and um less less kind of insubstantial than um uh, cardiac arrest was and so the it was right finding the best way to represent that and it became very clear almost immediately that big changes were required that the kind of medicine that was portrayed in in the novel was was quite a, an intellectual form of medicine it was it it was what's called internal medicine or general medicine and most of the time you're making diagnoses through tests and um you're doing trials of treatment and it's not very exciting to look at visually so the decision was made to change the specialization to obstetrics and gynecology, where um, it's it's got surgery, uh, particularly with the obstetrics, it's really it's really clear to lay people what's going on. They know that they know the baby's got to come out, and there are only two ways it can come out. And if it's not coming out, then it's an emergency. So you don't really need to know a huge amount about biology in order to be able to follow the ups and downs of the drama. But at the same time, I think your your work often balances that thing where you do use jargon and you do use um, industry lingo, mm. and and sometimes as a viewer, we're not always sure what's you know being said really. But you 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 you, you know you're not patronising to your audience, are you? You're basically saying you'll work this out. You may not know at this very second what it means, but you will. Yeah. Infer, you know. Yeah, I mean that goes back to cardiac arrest and that the, the first thing I wrote. One of the major reactions to the first script was how much technical dialogue there was um but one of the points i kept making uh to the editorial team was that it 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 was strange as a doctor to watch shows like casualty which was was on then and there were other medical dramas on where the doctors didn't talk like doctors they very rarely use technical language and and if they did it, it was usually a kind of pigeon ver- version of, 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 of medical English that, that didn't ring true. So the challenge was to have all that technical dialogue being bandied about, but to dramatise the story in a way that you could still follow what was at stake, even if you didn't understand every technical term. And that's something that... Um, I, I did in in later medical works, and and that was something that then went into uh, line of duty when we first started. When I first started getting advice from police officers about the the technicalities of policing, um, it was a really interesting process because initially the the police advisors were were hesitant to give too much technical information because they said, oh, you, you know, we watch police series on TV. You need to take a bit of dramatic license. It's all too boring and complicated how we really do it. And, and actually, I, I just found it fascinating and I wanted to portray that on screen. And although Line of Duty and, and, and Bodyguard have big action set pieces and there, there are times when when the most kind of implausible stuff happens because it's all, you know, it's all happening so fast and there are loads of guns and blue lights and all that sort of stuff when it comes to the basics of policing like processing evidence and interviewing people that we, we do take the technical side very very seriously and the procedures that we portray g- give a real identity to the series people have commented that that, that the way line of duty approaches police interviews the way it, it um, approaches the, the the admin side of policing the way it, approaches the handling of evidence, the, the expected conduct at crime scenes, all those things are, are, were very different to what a lot of cop shows were doing in the past and and some still continue to do. 
Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. And you mentioned you mentioned that you you were kind of learning on the job uh, with cardiac arrest, and um, you said you came to people like McKee and and other writers, script gurus, whatever you want to call them. You came to that later on. Did you mm. then? Did you then learn things from them, or did you? Did oh you... yeah, absolutely. I mean, what happened was I I was working as a doctor, and I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I I kind of come out of the air force. And I was going through a selection procedure with the Army Air Corps. Uh, and I, to be honest, I thought that we'd do one series of, of cardiac arrest and that would be done and dusted. And then I'd go go off to, to, to be, be uh, uh, an officer, probably in the, in the Army Air Corps and, and do aviation medicine. And I probably wouldn't do any more writing. Um, but actually, we got recommissioned. I was enjoying working on a second season. And, and, and at that point, I had a bit more time um, uh, to to think about my writing. And so I did those weekend workshop courses. I, I read McKee and, and other books about the theories of, of screenwriting, uh, the, the Sid Field videos and, and so on. And I, I found it really interesting uh, the way in which they they were giving names to to. to to things that, that, that they were creating a, a a cognitive framework for storytelling that um, was talked about a lot in meetings and and obviously you have a natural instinct for storytelling by, based on generally watching TV um, so it was very interesting to see that that theory being laid out and um, what I kind of concluded was that. Um, there wasn't one overall vision, one, one o overall dominant um, idea for how you go about storytelling. But but each of those script gurus had something interesting and, and inspiring to say. And and if there is something that helps you, then it's absolutely worth your while to, to study what what they're teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that, Jed, because uh, a lot of our students are reading and studying some of these writers. So it's good, uh, you know, it's good to hear it from from you. Oh, yeah. And I, I still find it really interesting to read um, yeah. the, those insights. I mean, but but going back to what I said, there's no dominant form. If there was. Then everyone would be using it. It's it, it's like swimming strokes. It's like in in in. In the Olympics, when it's freestyle, you can do any stroke you want, but everybody does front crawl because that's the fastest way to get across the pool. In storytelling, there is no front crawl. Um, there's no dominant form. It's all freestyle and you can do whatever stroke you want. And I guess what's happened really since McKee and Truby and, and Field and, and so on is this new thing, this, this long form drama which no one really predicted and, and, and it's still a relatively new thing, isn't it? How do you think that's kind of changed the game, if, if at all? Oh, it's changed it hugely. Um, and it's really down to the technology. So when, when I started working on cardiac arrest in the mid 90s, um, I remember one of the first script editors telling me not not to make the story too complicated because I had to remember that a lot of people watch TV while doing their ironing and they weren't really concentrating on it. And that was quite a prevalent view, not necessarily within that production company, that, but in terms of the industry, um, there were lots of uh, broadcast executives who honestly believed that the audience barely paid attention to the programming, barely could remember what had happened in the previous week's episode of a serial and therefore there was no point even trying to develop a story which involved them being able to remember what happened in in the previous episode and you know that that was from the culture of the episodic drama where each episode bears absolutely no relation to another it's all just a self-contained story um i always took the view as someone who'd enjoyed watching tv growing up that i was perfectly capable of remembering what had happened in a previous episode and what shows like hill street blues for example which i really admired and was a big inspiration for me and they had stories that that had arcs that went over uh, a number of episodes and some of them were quite complicated 
And I found the experience of viewing a show like that all the richer because of it. So when the technology started to change and catch up became much more of a, um, a way in which people would, would choose to watch and they would be able to go back and rewatch material, they'd, um, they, they'd be able to binge and so on. Then executives saw that, that certain kinds of programming that involved complex serial storytelling were, were doing well. And it, it kind of won the argument that it was possible to hold a mass audience, even with quite a complex serial story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm aware we've been chatting for half an hour, Jed, and there are lots of questions already in the chat. Um, so I'm going to turn to that, maybe come back to look at more craft, but let's just, you know, um, look at some of these questions. So Tim has asked, Line of Duty is known for twists and shock revelations. What are your favourite from TV shows or films you've watched in the past and have they inspired any of yours? Um, oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I love twists and turns in movies. And I think probably we're all familiar with some of the, the movies that have got really famous twist endings um, and kind of growing up watching those for the first time. Um, they had an enormous impact on me, you know, the end of Planet of the Apes, for example, um, which, you know, it w was so famous that it, it was hard to not to know that that was going to be the twist at the ending. We, we all remember the twist ending of uh, Sixth Sense. Um, I also really loved the, the ending of Dead Zone, um, the, the movie with um, Christopher Walken and the, the uh, Stephen King adaptation. I thought that was a really, a really smart way to do a very twisty but ironic ending. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned M Night Shyamalan. I, mean, I think you know the master of the twist, isn't he? Really. Um, and and that kind of uh, I saw the visit again recently, and um, that's got one of the best twists ever. I think you know. I mean, I won't say what it is if people haven't seen it, but it's it's mm. uh, it puts a chill down your spine every time you you mm. see it. You know. Mm. So Sam, Sam has asked, how do you keep a story running without losing quality through multiple seasons? How did you make something written about so often? Oh, these are two questions, actually. Uh, medical drama, police officers, et cetera, unique. So I don't know if you want to answer them as separate things. So yeah, the first one is yeah. about how you keep the quality on a long running show. Um, well, I think it, it's really about taking care of the episode you're writing. But the way that we approached Line of Duty and the way that we, we approached Bodyguard was not to to write the whole season arc in detail. And that's something that happens a lot on shows where there's a writer's room and there are multiple writers, because they, once they have constructed the story, they all have to go off and write their scripts in parallel. And so everybody needs to know which piece of the puzzle that they're, um, they're writing. Because there's only one writer, me, on Line of Duty and, and on Bodyguard, it was more about how um, how we make each episode um, the most impactful it can possibly be. And, and the way that that was approached was that I didn't really talk very much to the editorial team about the long term arcs. I kind of had long term arcs that I was planning, but I didn't share them. So. I would share an outline of the first episode or wh whatever episode I was uh, working on and the team would read it with no foreknowledge of what might be to come. And if they did ask me questions about what was to come, I, I would only answer if it was helpful. Often I would, I would not answer. So what we were creating was a writing process that was rather like the viewer's experience of watching it. The, view, the viewer watches what is happening in, in the episode that's on right now. They have no foreknowledge of what, what, what's to come. And so by simulating that experience as closely as possible, it really focuses you on making what's in front of you as interesting as possible. There's, there's no point saying that, um, well, it doesn't really matter if this episode's a bit dull because wait till you wait till you read the next one. That wouldn't really fly in our editorial process, and it doesn't work for um, for TV viewers either. If you if you do duff episodes, then the audience drifts away. So it's just really important to 
um, you know, to use another sporting analogy, play the shot in front of you. That's yeah. all you can do. Play one point at a time. I mean, it strikes me that you're very much in control of your product. And you mentioned being influenced by American um, drama as a child, you know. Mm. And it's a very different system, isn't it, where you have teams of writers who sit in a room and, you know, compete to have the best line or the best uh, plot twist or whatever. You know, you're essentially working on your own. And then at some stage you'll bring in editors and so on. Do you think that kind of alters the product in some in some way? I don't know that it does. I mean, I think we're all aiming for the same thing. I think the, the, the major problem of managing writers room is, is, is managing the personalities. So in, in terms of, of the model I've been working in, because I'm the only writer, um, I, I'm responsible for going away and actually d doing the drafting. But we still talk about the story ideas. I, I deliver an outline, people give feedback. We kick things around. People have suggestions of how to make things better. Uh, and that goes on right through the process. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to listen to people who've got better ideas than me. And then I just take the credit for them. Huh. Are you ever tempted to bring in other writers? You know, and there was pressure on, you know, long form drama to produce lots and lots of episodes, isn't there? Are you ever thinking, oh, you know what, I'll just bring in some really good writers and let them do it instead? Um, well, I've, I've worked in that that system on other shows and it's great I've, I've enjoyed the process of working with other writers and and that collaboration can be really helpful you know particularly if you're you, you you've got a shared vision and you you're you're kicking stories around then you go off and you write your own episodes but as, as you've said you you sometimes find that that can be very competitive and sometimes competitive in a way that's damaging to, to the project. So I think I would just take it on a case by case basis. The fact is on on Line of Duty and Bodyguard, I enjoy doing the drafting on, on my own and I enjoy the collaborative editorial process that takes place through throughout the, the script development and the production. And when you've got something that you think is worth seeing, you know, when you've gone through various drafts, I mean, are you somebody who does a lot of rewriting? How many sort of drafts typically would you do of, of an episode? Oh, tons. It's like I, I wouldn't even count. So what, yeah. what happens is I, I do an outline of an episode, which is normally a document that's about 10 pages long. And uh, then we have a meeting and we talk about it. And, and um, I'll probably do one more draft of the outline, um, which is just mainly for me so that I, I'm very, very clear on what I'm actually going to be putting into the draft. But I will also sometimes deliver that back if, if there are areas that I still don't feel are quite working. And then I'll write a first draft, I'll deliver it, uh, we'll have a meeting and we'll just carry on drafting until we get to the point where everybody thinks it's good enough. Uh, and that's, that doesn't mean that that's the end of the process. Once I start writing the next episode, it may be that things come up which need to be reverse engineered into the preceding episode. It may be that I suddenly get a brainwave about something in, 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 in an earlier episode that could be miles better or um, think that a scene from a previous episode works better in the episode I'm working on now and I need to do a little swap. Or it, it, It's a constant back and forth process until we get to the end of the season. And, then, and even then, I'm dipping in and out. And then when we're shooting, I'm dipping in and out. Sometimes we shoot stuff and... and I do a rewrite after we've shot it and we shoot more stuff. Um, so it's just it's just endless. When you're writing character, have you got particular actors in mind? Are you sort of casting as you go or is that something, you know, you wait, you keep the two things very separate? Because I know Sally Wainwright did something for us recently and she was talking about having certain actors in mind when she writes her characters. Yeah, I, I think that that can be helpful sometimes, but ultimately... The, um, the actor you get is the actor who's who's interested and available. And it may be that you, you have an actor in mind, but when the, the time comes to commit to production, um, that they're not available to you or they read the script and they don't like it or they audition and they're rubbish or <laughs> whatever it is. You know, you just don't know. Um, generally speaking, we on the show we just we, we do open castings and we, we try not to do that I particularly feel that nowadays it, it can be a, a little counterproductive um, in terms of diversity to be too fixated on who 
who you want to play a role. So I'm, I'm always very keen to say to casting directors, um, br bring in the, 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 the widest diversity of actors for this particular role and we'll just pick the best person for the job. And sometimes that that diversity isn't isn't just ethnic diversity, it's gender diversity as well. And and uh, some some roles that are that are written in in one gender or, or come off the page is appearing to be one gender. We end up changing that because the right actor um, just really excites us, and we go a different way. And and uh, the, the same with ethnicity. And the other the other part to Sam's question was how did you make something written about so often, i.e., medical drama, police officers, etc., unique? Because it I is. Think yeah, it is I think that's a big challenge. For, yeah, I think that's a big challenge for for writers working in television, which is that there is a reason that certain genres, certain precincts are dominant, and um, the reason for that is is you know a mixture of cause and effect. The fact is that there are a lot of crime thrillers, um, which means that, that commissioners must be commissioning a lot of them, which means that they must be keen on them. And enough of those do well that the commissioners are reassured that the audience likes them too. So um, it's a pretty strong genre to set your story in, um, but clearly you need to, to, to find that balance between satisfying genre expectation but also doing something distinctive so people feel that it's just not a rehash of other stuff i suppose i was very lucky with my medical um writing because i wrote from the viewpoint of having experienced it so my primary experience of writing about medicine was not other medical fiction which is the influence for most people who write medical drama my, my influence was the primary experience of actually being a doctor. So um, it, it's interesting when you look at, at shows that are written from that point of view, um, th this is going to hurt being the most recent example. You, you do see a, a slightly different approach. You do see um, portrayals of cynicism, of things going wrong, of, of, of a more oppressive hospital environment than you see in medical dramas that are influenced by other works of medical fiction, where they tend to portray a much more sunny and and hopeful view of, of hospital life. Because, yeah, and I think it's a valid point, though, isn't it? Because you do, I think when you're writing uh, a police drama or uh, a medical drama, there are certain procedural scenes like the interview or like the operation or like the consultation or whatever that kind of play out in a similar way, don't they? When yeah. when a criminal is interviewed, there is a process and you kind of have to stick to that, otherwise it won't be authentic. And so there are very, very much strictures in place in terms of what you can do and make it different and it's a challenge, isn't it? Surely it, it is a challenge, but I, I also think there are plenty of shows that break it in a way that, if you if you analyse it, it is, is laughable. Um, and and so if you're if you're looking for inspiration for for writing within within a, a precinct or within a, a genre, I, I I would always recommend that writers look at the real world. The real the real world is the way it is for a reason, and. If, if you study real world procedures, it may well be that you'll see something that, that you just haven't seen portrayed in um, a dramatic fiction. It may be that you'll, you'll do that and make an informed choice that actually you don't want to try and be authentic to the real world. You want to do something more escapist. You want to apply more dramatic license. So you might want to do a scene where someone giving a statement to a police officer is done as a walk and talk, which is obviously not how they do it, but that happens in a lot of police dramas. Or uh, the other thing is you may, you may choose to go about writing crime fiction in a way that doesn't exist at all in the real world by having your protagonist be an amateur sleuth. Um, I, I, I would challenge anybody uh, listening today to um, to tell me if they've actually ever met an amateur sleuth um, mm. and I think if you went up to a 
a police crime scene and said, let me throw on an amateur sleuth, you wouldn't get very far. So Sherlock Holmes isn't real then? But there is a statue to him, so um, so uh, the writers must have been doing something right. Have you been to the museum? No, I haven't. I haven't. Because there's actually a letter from somebody from China, I think. Okay. He's, he's written to Sherlock Holmes in, in, in the belief that this person exists, asking if they solve his crime. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of like the people who who write into EastEnders thinking the characters are real. Mm, no. uh, they're now all on Twitter, of course. Indeed. Now, Alison asks, what is your daily writing routine when you're writing a greenlit show, Jed? As a writer, I'm always interested in other people's routines, especially when you are juggling various shows, drafts, showrunner responsibilities. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And it's what's particularly helpful about the way it's framed is drawing the distinction between development and production. If, if you're in development, obviously, you can just take as much time as you want. I mean, people say, oh, there's a deadline. We need it next week, but they don't. But if you're in production, then it's it's pretty serious to, to have delays in, in delivering scripts. There are huge knock on consequences. So you need to be disciplined. You need to stay on schedule. Um, but I find because I'm a showrunner and I'm involved in all aspects of production, it means I'm not necessarily at, at, at my desk all day able to do the drafting there. So I have to be flexible enough to take my laptop to set or to the production office or wherever I am. And if I've got some some time to write in that environment and, and just make sure that the the whole production, which is is relying on script delivery to do their planning um, can be reassured that they're going to get the information they need. And sometimes you have to admit you're a bit behind on the script, but then you have to brief them on what the locations are going to be, uh, what ca what new characters might be coming in so that they can start doing the casting and and all, all those aspects that really put pressure on the writing process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've got, um, oh, the question's disappeared. There was a question from Emily. Um, where's it gone? No, she's deleted. Oh, it's there. Odd, it disappeared. Do you have, this is from Emily, do you have any influence in areas like casting, set, costume, uh, since you already have an image of what the story looks like? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a true showrunner, so um, I, I'm not someone who just kind of like, takes an executive producer credit and doesn't get involved. I really enjoy getting involved in the process. And uh, as, as a, a showrunner or executive producer, I'm on set pretty much every day for at least part of the day. I'm, I, I'm involved in the casting process, even if I'm not in the room. If one of the directors is, is, is leading the casting, I'll, I'll look at the tapes. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm involved across the whole process and that's what you know a true showrunner is is someone who is the creative leader of of every aspect of, of the production that doesn't mean I, I i i deal in all the details but all the heads of department will report to me the direct the directors and i the cast and i the the producers and i will always be having day-to-day -day conversations about the show we're making yeah we've got another question from alison congratulations on the recommission of Trigger Point, she says, first of all. Thank you. The first time writer Daniel Briley came through mentoring through a TV bursary. As it's been so successful, are you thinking about doing it again with a new writer? Also, how much do you overwrite? I don't overwrite. Um, it, it, it's very much the understanding that um, the, the writer does the writing and, and I will, like other producers, exec producers, directors, and script editors just give notes. Um, occasionally, um, we'll, we'll have a, a, a real brass tacks conversation about the, the, the real detail of constructing a scene. But again, it's just a conversation about going about it. The, there's only one keyboard on the script, and that's the writers. Um, and I think that's really important as, as part of the process to, to empower them. and. Uh, to be honest, I want to work with writers who can write. There's no, there's no point having writers on board who can't do it. And and Daniel Briley's a great example of someone who um, had a brilliant idea for a, for a, a 
a TV series or a, a, a really excellent pilot that I was fortunate fortunate enough to, to mentor him through. In the same way, Chris Brandon, who's uh, written Bloodlands, which we're currently shooting season two of, um, was was writing his first original show. And Maya Sondi, who's um, also just written her first original series that we shot in Birmingham uh, just before Christmas. So it's very exciting to work with new talent, uh, find new voices. Um, but but absolutely, it's about empowering the writer, not, not about me overwriting. Yeah. So I guess what's implied in that answer is that you will be doing it again. You will be working. Oh, that. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're always looking for, for new talent. I mean, a lot of it now that the, the production company is up and running uh, work is is being submitted through agents we're, we're out there meeting writers and and discussing projects and uh, uh th- there are mentoring scheme schemes up and down the country and and it's great that they're there uh there aren't enough of them because um i, I think it's a really important way to 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 make our industry more inclusive and particularly if they're targeted at people who live outside of london people who um come from from less privileged backgrounds you know i i had to be commercially successful as a writer from the word go otherwise i i wouldn't have been able to carry on uh and i know lots of actors who um had to be successful straight away couldn't afford to go to to drama school for example um and if they didn't meet with success pretty early on in in, in their 20s then they they stopped becoming actors yeah yeah um thank you yeah we've got um we've got still, still people joining the, the, the meeting actually um with 10 minutes to go which is fine um so we've got ralph asking a question here ralph uh, it says do you ever go back and feel i wish we had done that differently to get peak effect across a whole series and i guess what's what's been asked there as well really is how much do you kind of know with something like line of duty for example how 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 far did you know in advance how you're going to end that show? Um, I didn't. Um, I mean that the, the when the series was created, uh, the only thing that that was planned was the returnability of the series through through the device of making AC12 the investigators, and then each season has. A high-profile guest lead who is the the officer under investigation, um, and that was something that felt quite novel um, at the time. And we we were very careful to explain to the BBC that it was a returnable series rather than what appeared to be a um, a closed-ended serial. Uh, so when we were fortunate enough to be successful with season one, the one with with Lenny James in the lead. Um, the, the AC12 cast were all optioned for a second season, and um, Keedy Hawes came in uh, as Lindsay Denton and, and, and took over, and, and the series really progressed from there. But in terms of how how long we'd go on for and what the what how the arcs would unfold, it was always something where we took stock at the end of every season. There would be some loose ends deliberately left there, um, some unintentionally left there. Um, and, and when we were getting recommissioned, it was always like, how, how do we pick up the loose ends, but also break new ground? And that's always been the challenge of the series. We, we, we try to make the first episode of each new season all new material. So no back references at all. Uh, um, generally, the story being carried by characters we haven't met before. Um, and it's only as the series gathers momentum, sort of starting sort of early mid series that we then start to to bleed in some of the the the, the meta narrative from previous seasons because and, and i guess with something like that of duty which, which is what is it 10 10 years it's gone over is it 10 years something like that yeah so we shot season one in 2011 in birmingham and and then it aired summer 2012 yeah so you have to be fairly agile don't you because actors come and go and they change and they're mm-hmm. doing things and so whatever you may have in mind in terms of planning it out over uh, any length of time you have to be flexible i guess really and and, and yeah and... It's, it's it's hard to plan because you kind of you know and anyone who's worked on a long-running series will tell you um if you're you're recommissioned and you're looking at the next season and you think oh this is um 
that there's a great story we can tell with such and such a character. And then what you find out is that that actor doesn't want to come back or they've taken another job that goes across your dates and so you can't use them. And then it, it's a real setback. So um, that's just the reality of the industry. And, you know, we've been very fortunate with 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 Line of Duty that the, the three regulars, um, Martin, Vicky and Adrian, have always wanted to come back. And we've been able to carve out dates where, where they could all um, be on first call to the the show all the way through the season. And and then beyond that, we've started being able to put characters around them. But but often there are characters that we wanted to bring back and and the actor hasn't been available and we've had to rethink. You know, that's that's really been happening since um since I guess season three. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And Caroline asks your scripts and books require a lot of research. Are you able to put your finger on the point at which you know you're ready to stop researching, planning? No. Uh, I think it's different for everybody and different for for every project. I I, I tend to think that the, the, the writing should lead the research rather than the research should lead the writing. Uh, because what you what can happen is you just get into a point where you're you're actually just enjoying reading around the subject and there's always more to find out you can never become an expert in a, in a subject overnight and so you're for whatever reason you're 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 visiting places you're meeting people you're doing your research online you're reading books and suddenly you realize two months have gone by and you haven't written a scene so i do try to start writing as quickly as possible in that process because that tells me two things the first thing is it it, it tells me um whether this is a project that 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 has legs whether it's actually going to happen or not and i'm not wasting all this time on research and the other thing is it really helps focus the research i need to do it, it's like you, you know you can spend a lot of time doing research on procedure and then you sit down to write the first scene and you've got no idea what location a scene would take place in. And you think, oh, right, I need to just quickly find out where would they interview this type of suspect? Because, I mean, I know you work with advisors on things like Land of Juicy, but you, you, you must presumably now know a fair amount about police procedure. And, you know, the way that you approach something like that, you, you know, even just creating a simple scene where an officer asks another a member you know member of the team something you kind of need to know rank and file don't you you kind of need to know you know what the process is in each situation so you kind of you must have to do quite a bit of research before you can even write a simple scene between you know two officers let's say um well i think it depends what's happening in the scene um and and what 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 you might need to know and that goes back to what i was saying about about being specifically focused on the research you you'd only really know what you don't know um by trying to write the scene uh, but it's certainly true that that having written um six seasons now of line of line of duty that um that, that there are lots of procedures that I, I am familiar with and um i don't need to consult the advisors and then there are other times um at the outline stage for example where I realize it's something that we've never done before and I have absolutely no idea how it, how it might happen in the real world. And then I need to consult the advisors on on um, how to even construct a story. You know, wh what would happen to this particular character? Where um, What procedures would be applied given what we want them to have done? Or how would they go about achieving the thing they're trying to do? I mean, a classic example of that was in season four, um, the character of Ros Huntley um, needed to tamper with evidence. And um, I, I didn't want to just make up how she would do it. So I talked to the police advisors about how how she might succeed in, in tampering with evidence. Thank you, Jed. Well, we're coming to the end of this session, sadly. And um, I think before we kind of wrap up, really, I'd like to ask I know a question that a lot of my students, you know, really are burning to ask, although they've not asked it in the chat, having said that, um, which is really, you know, your advice in terms of them uh, going into the industry. You know, you, you mentioned the mentoring you've done 
with Daniel and so on. Uh, but there are fewer and fewer opportunities, aren't there, for new writers? And even things like continuing drama, which at one point was quite open to new writing, things like Doctors regularly had new scripts, new writers. That's really closed, isn't it, now? And, and it's much harder. I know the BBC Writers' Room opened their window, you know, to drama writers, to comedy writers, periodically. Um, outside of that, you've got a few competitions, haven't you? But there isn't a great deal of opportunity and, and open doors. So what, what would you advise, really? Well, I, I mean, I, I've never worked on the soap, so I, I'm not really qualified to say how, how inclusive their, their policies are. I, I can only talk about creating original drama. And, and I do think the door is open. Um, I, I think if, if someone out there is writing a spec script and it's good and could be a TV show, then I think there are lots of production companies that would be interested in reading it. Um, I think the problem is that, that a lot of writers think that the way to go is direct to the broadcasters. And the problem there is that the broadcasters are set up to commission work that is originated and developed through the independent production companies. So a much better target would be the independent production companies you feel are a good fit for your writing. And what I what I advise there is if you're if you're working on an idea, if you're working on a, on a script, um, have a think about what what it resembles in ter either tonally or in content or, or or whatever features of it you you feel you feel have some kind of correlation with something you've seen on British television, and find out who made it. Find out the production company behind it. Find out whether the the producers or the exec producers work for that company. Almost certainly. The exec producers will work for that company and just approach them directly. All these companies have websites. They all they all have contact information and don't send unsolicited material. Just make contact and say, look, I've got this particular idea. Would you be interested in reading it? Um, I'm, a, I'm a big adm admirer of this other show you made. And and I feel this is tonally similar and um, I'd love to work with you. And people tend to respond to that kind of um considered and and flattering approach i think where people get defensive is when they're hit with unsolicited material and immediately they're worried about being sued um you know when when i i did bodyguard the, the number of kind of frivolous lawsuits related to, to that was actually quite eye-opening people who who got unpublished no novels claiming somehow I'd stolen a chapter and things like that. It's it's so th that side of it ends up being quite an important consideration. But if you if you approach people in the way of you're not hitting them with unsolicited material, you're making an approach, asking them whether they would be interested in reading your spec script, which is about a certain subject and it's approached in a certain way. And, and it's a certain format. It's the, the, the other thing is that television is in, is devours returnable series, but has a very, very limited market for singles and one offs. And, it, and, and it's quite dispiriting to see how many um, people developing their careers as TV writers are focusing too much on singles and, and, and short form work that you know that, that even the most successful tv writers would struggle to sell um mm. because everybody wants returnable series or they want longer run series i guess it's kind of understandable in a way isn't it because the investment required to let's say write i don't know 20 uh, episodes of a series or whatever um requires a huge leap of faith doesn't it for someone who's not been commissioned who's not had a break in the industry um, so, so the idea to think along those those smaller, uh, more discreet kind of story ideas is is probably more tempting, isn't it? it? It's tempting, but ultimately, it's less likely to be successful. The, the 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 fact is that we we tend not to commission shows that run at twenty episodes anyway. I mean, the the industry standard on on the terrestrials is is somewhere between four and six. So, season one of Bloodlands that Chris Brandon created was four four one hour episodes. Season two is six. Um, Maya Sondi's uh, show called D.I. Ray, 
four hours. Um, trigger point was six, which was great that we could do six. Season two will probably be six. Um, so, so that's the run, and and it it's something which one writer is perfectly capable of writing. Uh, there was never any question that Maya or Chris or or uh, Daniel wouldn't write all of uh, of their shows. Um, but the starting point for all of them was that first script, which very clearly set up as a commercial proposition a a returning TV series. And it, it, it's fine to write if, to, to write a one off or a, a, a single drama or a, or a feature film script as a calling card. But that's all it's going to be unless you work in feature films. And that's great. There are obviously opportunities in feature films. But in the UK, our television industry is vastly larger than our feature film industry. So. If you're if you're going to go where the opportunities are, then you're better advised to be constructing TV series ideas. And if you write a good pilot script, then absolutely people will 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 trust you to do more. They may need more assurances than it, than if a more established writer did. But usually that that happens as part of the development process anyway. That you then come up with some storylines for, for subsequent episodes with with Bloodlands. Chris Brandon wrote a second episode, which showed that he could sustain the story and that reassured the broadcaster. And and so Chris could write all the episodes. So all all those things are within the way the industry works. The industry is desperate for new talent. It's desperate for content. And it's the power of the ideas I, I, that a, a, a good idea that that is that is reasonably well executed will get you through the door. Um, if, if your ideas are just seem very derivative, it's a it's another version of a cop show or another version of a medical drama, and it has nothing new in it. Then of course it it will be very hard to achieve. Um, in exactly the same way that is, if you're trying to sell a single drama, the UK TV industry makes a handful of single dramas in a year. And, and and many of them are are, are are kind of commissioned in quite a random way. So um, I, I would absolutely recommend to writers developing their careers towards TV that they they focus on developing series ideas. Thank you, Jed. Thank you for that advice. Um, and thank you very much for taking your time this evening. Very generous of you. Uh, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I've enjoyed it. And I, I just hope it was helpful and, and oh, yeah. good luck to everyone in their in their writing. Um, I really enjoy being a writer and it's 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 a it's, it's a great way to spend your time. And our TV industry is one of the best in the world and that there are lots of opportunities out there. And if you really care about your writing and you work really hard, then you will succeed. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jed. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.